So this is called um, Essential Erlang OTP. This is the right talk We're in the right place here. Um, so the goal here is, so how many people uh, have, uh, have uh, a code running in production in Erlang right now or, or around about? Okay. How many people have written code, uh, written an application, but it's not running someplace, but you've, done, you've written something and completed it, and, and even if it's a, a sample thing, and that's, that's cool. How many people have just tinkered with the language? Okay. Okay. And how many people have done nothing, nothing at all, and it's, it's fine, there's no, okay, this is good. All right, so the last two categories, I think, well, I think every, I'm, trying to, I'm tr trying to make this talk interesting for everybody, uh, but it's, it's mainly geared sort of as context or base, you know, uh, context setting for, for Erlang. Uh, and uh, and so we're to go to, into the really advanced stuff with, with concurrency and message passing, and then we're going to take a step back into like fundamentals here. So that's where, that, that's where we're at with con in the conference. So for me, when I look at a language, it's really important to look at, I look at it as a culture. I look at it as a group of, not just the technology, um, but you, you have the founding, the founders, the, the technologists who, who introduce the technology. Usually there's f f waves of f follow up um, after that, uh, advancing the technology. That's all cultural. Um, there are users, there are applications. It's all, it's all very human. It's all very social. And uh, I, I have a really hard time looking at technology purely for, from a feature set standpoint because it's much more than that. Uh, it's, it's, you know, when you go to a question, I uh, have a question about something, you go to a list, you ask a question. You know, are there people there who know what you're talking about? Uh, are there people that are smarter than you are about the problems that you have? Um, and Erlang is a, is a really fantastic uh, sort of cultural ecosystem, I think. And a lot of that has to do with where it started. So I want to talk a fair amount about the history of Erlang uh, as a part of this essentials. Uh, you know, it, it informs one's thinking about, about Erlang, and it helps a lot of things, I think, make sense that otherwise are a bit confusing. So it all started back, um, I think this is probably the, 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 the right starting point here. Um, the, the ACK system was uh, sort of the mainstay uh, switch for, uh, uh, still, is, still is, I, I believe, uh, for Ericsson, and used a, a language called Plex, which is a, a, a basic-like language. And so this is the, 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 the foundation, this is the, you know, what Ericsson engineers are work with and what expectations they have. It's, it's, level set, it's level setting for new things to follow. So when you look at Plex, it's a really interesting language. You can go down the bullets here, and it, it may sound familiar to you, but this isn't back in the 80s. This is, this is a long, a while ago now. Uh, so safe pointers, um, you know, fine grade and massive concurrency. Does that sound familiar at all? If you've read the, you know, the back of the Erlang box and you're like, okay, yeah, yep, got that. Independent isolated software blocks. So, you know, isolation, process isolation was there. Um, update code at runtime without stopping. That's interesting. Yep, that's right on the back of the, yep, that's the fifth bullet there. Uh, tracing and then restart mechanisms. All of these things that we are so used to seeing featured as, as Erlang existed before Erlang and it existed in production. Uh, it existed in, in wildly, you know, humongously large complex systems uh, that <laughs> mattered a great deal to people. Um, now this is a quote from Joe Armstrong. This is a table side quote. I got permission from Joe to, to, to actually publish this. So, so this is a scoop here. Uh, you'll only see this at the uh, Chicago Erlang Factory Light. This is an exclusive quote that has never before been seen in print. So he said, we were sitting around and, and chatting at lunch and he, you know, he was talking about sort of the, the way Ericsson approached the, the systems. Well, they're doing you know, telecom switches uh, and they have downtime. It affects you know, it's a you know, huge implication. So they were financially incented. Now 10,000 is, is just representative of some number, but it was probably in a different currency. Um, but the point is that we're talking about four minutes of downtime a year. So if you're one second over four minutes of downtime, downtime per year, there were fines. And so there's a lot at stake when you, you know, talk about languages or technology, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? This is sort of the, the, the bottom line uh, for, for the folks that do doing, doing work at Ericsson. So with that in mind, with that sort of seriousness in mind, uh, enters uh, the, the folks who brought Erlang uh, to, to life. And their goal was to try to take Plex, the feature set of Plex, which is a, a fairly complex, difficult to work with uh, language, and make it easy to use, make it uh, highly productive for developers, to programmers to build these really reliable uh, distributed systems. This is uh, 
According to Robert Verding, he does, no one knows where this came from. I, I believe, if that's false, if somebody knows where this came from, we should document that. But uh, according to Robert, nobody knows where this came from. It's just, it, it's, it's, so it's kind of like a sacred text. It's like, we don't know where this, well, where did this come from? This is, so this is our sacred text. So I'm gonna actually use the sacred text here to talk about, you know, in this, this is basically, let me explain what our, our uh, I'm gonna put my goggles on here and I'll read this for you. Um, so we have in the middle uh, is this, up here, uh, 86 through 98, that's the time span. Um, and it t talks about uh, sort of openness. These are the different vectors of, of interest in, in the language of Erlang. Wars, marketing, technique, users, developers, uh, more users, and then support staff here. But anyway, it's a very nice sort of chronology of, of the evolution of Erlang during sort of the critical informative years. So what I'd like to do is just point out a few things. There's a lot of information in the sacred text, but I want to point out some things that I think are worth, worth sort of highlighting here. So the first thing is this, this, this prologue interpreter. So if anyone looks at Erlang and says, wow, this is a really weird looking language, you can thank this decision. This, this very simple uh, result of using prologue to write something uh, caused the syntax to resemble prologue. It's evolved a little bit. You know, Joe, Joe, Joe developed a, a legitimately independent separate language, but this is a, a father. You know, this is, there's a lot of genetic uh, relationship between Erlang and prologue. This is just a decision that was made early on and we have uh, the result of that today. So, based on based on some of these the early decisions, uh, one of one of which was you know, we mentioned uh, Prolog. There's no there's no global data in in Prolog, so there's no global data in Erlang. That was just a, a natural outcome of that. Not terribly controversial. Uh, you'll see in a minute how these systems are designed and architected. But that's for these folks. That was not controversial for us. Maybe you know mortals of you know using imperative languages like you know Java, Python, Ruby, basically almost anything uh, you know, non-functional. You tend to just live and breathe global state. Um, but this was a non-starter for for the folks looking at developing a new language within the Ericsson context. Each process has its own stack and heap. Um, so uh, Robert, this is, this is lifted off of a presentation uh, from Robert Verding, uh, one of the three uh, language founders. So notice, that, notice there's a sacred text, there are founders, that we'll call them fathers. Um, so yes, this is looking you know, like a religion and, and this is all intentional, so you, you're tracking with me here. Um, Non-disruptive garbage collection. So uh, Robert, as sort of uh, uh, looking at um, some of these design decisions, uh, you know, considered context switching and, and, and garbage collection. Experimented with a global heap. Um, you know, realized that it was very, very fast, uh, but very complicated to implement. Very complicated to to do garbage collection. And if you know anything about garbage collection. Um, you can read all about garbage collection in uh, Oracle's documentation on Java VM. It's a fascinating read. Uh, it's very, very, very uh, you know, complex and lots of diagrams. You, you can appreciate, begin to appreciate the difficulty of garbage collection. When you have uh, separate heaps, one heap per process, garbage collection in, in that sense becomes very simple. So Robert was looking at that, said, okay, here's the trade-off. Um, if we have a global heap, we get a lot of performance, but uh, it complicates things, it undermines the st stability of the system, and in the end, it wasn't worth it. So I want to highlight this point here, that in our, I guess, yeah, maybe just hu hu the humankind, we tend to ob obsess over performance and speed and how high you can jump, and you know, we have Olympics and sporting events, etc. So it's very natural for us to apply that instinct to languages or technology. So the faster, the better. You know, the lower the latency, the better. And we have these wars, and there's you know some you know video clever videos out there that uh, poke fun at some of the uh, obsession of uh, performance, but. The folks who are doing this, this, this language here say, look, you know, we got the performance, but look, here's a trade-off. And you'll see in the airline community that, that this topic comes up all the time. You know, isn't it very inefficient to pass things by value? Isn't it inefficient to do that? And then you'll just get this wave of, of, of you know, measured and respectful response. But basically, it comes down to, look, you know, it isn't obvious that you should go faster all the time. Um, there are different trade-offs to consider. So this is, this is some of the tinkering that happened early on in the language development. So, also scoop. Yes, yes, this is also 
uniquely yours. No one has ever seen this before. So this is a great quote. We were talking about, I've always, I've always found it interesting that for the design of the language in Erlang, it was a starting point that there was no shared memory, that it was only message passing. And if you look at languages, that's very unusual. So my question to Joe was, how did this come about? Like, how is it that you just figured out that message passing was the way to handle it, to do concurrency right? And, and, the, and the instantaneous response was, because they've been doing it that way for 15 years. So the, the developers of, of Erlang had this great foundation to build on. The systems we were building are worldwide distributed systems. So where's the shared memory when you've got a node in London and Paris and Stockholm? There is no shared memory. So you can see like just the mindset is like it has to be message passing. So that is why Erlang is the way it is today. There's no, no escaping it. If you're going to build something in Ericsson for this type of application, it's going to be message passing. And it's as simple as that. Okay. So this yellow, I think it's yellow, help me out here, people who aren't quite colorblind like me, whatever the swath here. Uh, what is it? Yellow. Oh, yes, excellent. Um, I could see the RGB values, so I, can, I, could, I could have checked that, but uh, thank you. You're lying to me, aren't you? Um, so, so Balmora Club. So the, 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 the point here is uh, the Erlang developers had customers that were using the code or wanted to use the code, were interested in the new language, the features, and interested in applying it within the context of Ericsson. And this, I think, is a bit unusual for a language. A lot of languages come up through either academic research or through uh, developer itches, developer um, wanting to improve something. Um, I think you can you know, sort of look through the top you know, 20 languages. I think most of them will fit in that category. There, there are some commercially derived languages. Um, but uh, a lot of times languages will start out kind of in an academic vacuum or a theoretical vacuum. This is definitely not the case. There were theoretical, there was experimentation, there was um, let's see how this works, but there was a strong commitment to we must get this into the hands of users. As we all know today, like that's a, that's a, a, a precept of Agile, which is really a precept of all development. Nobody says we're going to go develop something in a box for, for six months without any user feedback. And if you do, you're, you're probably going to fail. Um, so here is something that Robert um, stated. You know, we put a lot of stuff in there which weren't necessary. It's plural stuff is plural there, so I, I thought that sounded weird, but uh, the English tend to pluralize things um, in, in certain cases. Uh, we had misinterpreted the problem. So had a lot of stuff in there which, which, which that weren't necessary, but, but, <laughs> but, we, but we had misinterpreted the problem. And I, I pulled this out because I thought it was remarkable that, you know, when you, look at, when you look at Erlang, you'll see that it is a fairly small language. There's not a lot of features. And this has always mystified me because it's really a very capable language. And you think capable languages or anything capable should have a lot of features. It should have a lot of bells and whistles. But philosophically, the, the developers of this language were kind of against that. So here's another quote from Robert. Most of the things you'll find in the language today are actually being used. Now he's being a little snarky there because there's a lot of features. You, know, you put something in and it's not used, but it's there. It's there as a trap. It lays wait for somebody and, and you know, somebody uses it or misuses it. And then you learn through you know, uh, your, uh, your misfortunes that you shouldn't have done that. So Robert's point is things which aren't being used have been removed. So you have a, what's the, what's the uh, extreme programming? Uh, you ain't going to need it. So uh, there's another one uh, called, we, ain't, we haven't used it. This is something that uh, Jim Fulton from Zoe Corporation liked to use. Um, if something isn't being used in your program, take it out. It's, it's proof that you don't need it. And you know, if there's one thing that I could tell a developer, a programmer, to, to, to like codify in every, every respect religiously, it's that. If you're not using code, take it out. And, I'm encouraged to see that this was the mindset of, of, the, of the founding fathers of the early development of this language. So, swath number three. I really don't know what that is. I'm going to call it baby blue. Is that right? Is that fair? It's bluish, powder blue? Powder blue? Yeah. Okay. Um, started out as a functional declarative. Now, this is sort of the marketing spin, but um, when Erlang came into being, it was sort of touted as like this highly leverageable, almost a DSL, symbolic, logical, declarative uh, language that you could use to describe the algebra uh, of, of a telecom switch, telecom system. And what they discovered was over time that you could get 
you know, 80, 90 percent of the functionality you needed, but the 20 percent that remained needed a, a general purpose language. So the language evolved from a very high level language to a sort of a standard language. And I make this point to say um, a slightly is a slight indirection here that Erlang has a reputation as being the go-to tool for scalability, for concurrency, for fault tolerance, for reliable systems, and all that's true. But I would I would advocate that Erlang is an excellent, excellent general purpose programming language, just as good as Python, just as good as, as Ruby. It may not feel as the same. You approach things a little bit differently. But as a proof of this, uh, at CloudBees, we originally were, we, all of our backend systems were written in, in, most of them were written in Python. Um, I had a particularly high concurrency problem. It was, it was a legitimate sort of difficult problem to solve using shared memory. And uh, this is how I learned Erlang. We introduced a, a monitoring system that was uh, fairly complex and it worked well in Erlang. And I felt, yes, we solved this, this monitoring problem, but I also felt that this was a system that, that was, was solid and reliable and I, I worried less about it. Uh, it crashed less, uh, it, it just ran smoothly. I'm like, well, wouldn't that be nice if we could just do that with everything? So systematically, not, over, not in the course of a day, but in the course of, of years, I you know, phased out the Python in, 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 on the backend systems, and we re replaced it with Erlang. You can debate that. You can debate that decision. Um, you can look at the results and say, you know, good, bad, ugly. But the point is that we were able functionally, you know, feature by feature, to replace Python. So it's not like you, know, you, you, you get Erlang and, and it's like you have to have some really complicated problem to solve. You can use it for mundane problems in the same way that you, you would use a Python or Ruby. I think that's a, that's a compelling, uh, you, you will see in, in a little bit, you know, there, there's some, some really good reasons to, to, to look at it that way. Okay, this I'm going to make a really quick point here, but um, the story of, of Erling would make a very good book. There's a lot of sort of, uh, you call them villains, make it interesting. They're not really, they're not evil people, you know. But, you know, Erling was banned at, 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 uh, at Ericsson. Um, you know, there were wars, there's wars with C++, there's wars with Java. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I'd like to, the point I'd like to make about, about uh, Erlang is if, if you're looking to adopt it or you have adopted it, uh, chances are you're going to be battling with, with somebody at some point over that decision. It's fine. Just, just consider it, you know, just you know, view it in the context of the history and say, yes, this is, this is, this is the battle that we take. This is what we do. This is, you know, when, when we use Erlang, we sign up for a certain amount of conflict and, you know, you work through that with your, your colleagues. But uh, uh, it's, never, it's, never, it's, never that, it's never that peaceful and it's never been that peaceful. That's okay. Okay, so that's the history lesson, and, and, and I just cherry-picked some, some parts of that. It's a, it's a really interesting sacred text document. Uh, we should you know, bring it up and, and read it in the morning before we go, you go to work and you know, just have sort of a routine where we internalize the history of it, because it's, it's that sort of religion, religion that we want. But this is really, if I could, if I could summarize something uh, about Erlang that I think was the most essential statement, the most important statement, is it's this. Erlang is an operating system for your code, and I'm giving myself attribution for this. Here's why. Joe Armstrong and Robert Verding are starting to say this. And it's like, I've been saying this for two years and then these upstarts come and they start, you know, they're taking all my thunder. I mean, not only do they create the language that, you know, I mean, I gotta have something, just a little, can I just have a little thing? So yeah, me, this is mine. You can Google it, I, I did that. I'm like, I wonder if somebody actually said this. I wonder if Robert actually, you know, but no, no, this is, this is it's a very small thing and I know I'm being petty, but I am being petty. Make no mistake about it. I'm being petty. Yeah, that's yeah. We'll get a, we'll, we'll get that one out soon. Okay. So to, to to describe, let me go back to this a second. I revealed that was a bad reveal. You go, oh, I shouldn't have revealed that. Now you're going to be thinking about that. Let me don't think about that for one second. When I say that something's an operating system for your code, you you should have like an ecstatic reaction. You should there should be like a welling up of emotion and, and tears and trembling and you speaking in tongues and all sorts of extreme <laughs> response to that. It's that profound and important statement. And I'm going to come back to that. I'm hopefully persuaded, but I don't think anybody here is welled up. Nobody here is crying. So I say that it's like yeah whatever. You know, check the whatever box. It's an operating system for your code, but it's important. So I'm going to persuade you that it's important. Here's, here's the starting point, okay? The reveal. Um, the Windows 3.1 syndrome. So who remembers Windows 
everybody, right? Every, almost every, no, some people don't. Some people don't. You guys, you know, that's all. Well, <laughs> it's like talking about the you know VAX or VMS. You know, it's, I'm at the point now where I'm. Yeah, I'm at that point now. Um, <laughs> so, 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 so I was really excited. I, I was I, I used Windows 1.0. I, I was like early Windows user before there was Windows. There was like an embedded Windows, so you'd get like a DOS program, and it would come with its own Windows runtime, and you'd fire it up, and it would have like this horrible interface, and it was just terrible. And so Windows 3.1 came out. It was like the first release of Windows that was not absolutely, objectively, horrifyingly bad. It was you know it was usable. You know there were applic you know that's when Excel and Word were sort of coming into their own and the Borland Microsoft Wars and so it was really, really exciting. But you know, Windows 3.1 has this 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 crazy architectural feature, which is when it's happy, it's very happy. You know, everybody is everyone is 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 you know you're using your applications and everything's working fine. And then something terrible happens. Or does something subtle happens? You know, it doesn't have to be terrible, it's just something bad happens within the operating system. So let's say that's Excel or whatever app you're running. Something, something goes wrong, and very soon, the whole operating system becomes corrupt, right? And what do you have to do? You restart it. So, I mean, if you're using Windows today, you have to restart it. Imagine this. I mean, Windows 3.1, there's a proper operating system today. You still have to restart it. Windows 3.1 was chronic, you know, and it's still used today in embedded cases, and there are, there are good applications for it. But it's a, it's not, it's a, it's a cooperative multitasking environment. It's a shared, there's no, there's no process isolation. Um, it's, you know, when you get a corruption in one, one piece, it spreads throughout the entire thing. And it basically, it, 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 it makes everything go dark. Let's take a look at a modern, op a modern operating system. This is, you know, running on your phones, it's running everywhere. So we, it's very hard to find, uh, outside of embedded systems or special applications, something that doesn't look like this. This is the way everything works today. So we have a kernel, and everybody's happy. Kernel provides core shared services, memory management, memory allocation, uh, access to hardware, uh, you know, the device driver layer, and then you have user space. So the happy faces are the user user applications. That's in user space, and they're very separate. And what happens in user space when something goes bad? It's okay, because kernel is managing everything, and everyone else is happy. There is no leaking or corruption, because the application is isolated. That's a fundamental design of every single operating system. Right? You can Im imagine running Windows 3.1 on your phone. Or imagine running it on your laptop. Now, I'm, I'm making fun of Microsoft. Mac, Mac OS 9 is the same thing. So it's just, it just the way things worked for desktop systems at that time, for personal computers at that time. But we've moved off of that. And they all look like this today. Right. So when you have isolation in your system, it means you can't share memory. The only way that you can communicate is through message passing. Again, operating system, your computers, your phones, they all do, this isn't controversial, right? So isolated processes, they can't share memory. The only way that they can communicate is through passing messages, right? So when you have isolation like this, you automatically have a system, operating system. They call it that. So now you have applications here running, you know, hither and yon, and if something goes bad, what? Right? If something fails here, what do you do? When Chrome is going crazy because of some Java script attack, what can you do? You can, you can not just restart Chrome, you can kill nine the, the tab. Chrome has separate processes for each tab. So you, when you click, when you try to close that tab, and if you can't get to it, you can, you, I have literally SSH'd to my laptop, so I could, because it was, because the machine was thrashing, and I could come in as root, kill nine that tab, and restore it, right, because of this, this isolation feature. So we, we monitor something and restart it. This is very, right, this thing here. This is Android, it's a Linux device, running a lot of Java. And uh, it's okay, you know, it's okay. It, it's not terrible. But I, I have to restart this thing all the time. I, I, I have to kill applications all the time. Um, you, you, know, uh, you know, if there's something behaving badly, I'll, you know, I'll end the application and remove it. But I, you know, the rest of the phones, for the most part, continues to work. It's not quite as isolated as it, as it, as it should be, but. Right. Um, my point here is that everything works this way, right? Is that controversial? It's not. Everything works this way, except your program. The software that you write doesn't work that way because everything has a shared heap. That's the default. There are very few languages have isolated processes like this. They're effectively running Windows 3.1. Yeah. So you guys are Windows 3.1 developers. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. Don't insult your audience. Ha. <laughs> yeah. No, it's. A, I mean. 
it's it's reality. And then, you know, when I was looking in Python uh, in for our backend system, the, the backend system is basically it's, you know this is something you put in a closet and you want it to run forever. You never want to go visit it. You want never want to go babysit it. You never want to look at it. You want it just to work. And the fact is that the operating cost of running an er Erlang application for us is, is less. It's quantitatively less than running Python. Now you could probably finagle Python in, but you're moving against the grain. P Erlang gives you uh, this feature set that is right in the heart and soul of operating system land. So when I say operating system for your code, you really should get excited. Because if you don't, you're, you are basically conceding that it is okay to run Windows 3.1. And we know that's not true. So, there are, so that's an anecdotal. That's kind of like, oh yeah, I don't want to, win, I don't want to run Windows 3.1, so I feel guilty now. And I'm going to do, hang on, let me, let me get to some substantive reasons. There are really, really good reasons for doing this. So I have three categories. I have performance, I have quality, and I have design. So let's talk about performance implications for your code, OS for your code. Remember the system diagram. Everything is isolated. Everything is that black box message passing. So we heard in the first talk how Erlang can be used to distribute across multiple cores. So distribution is, works uh, you know, across cores, it works across CPUs, it works across machines. The difference is you know, access to, you know, latency access to memory, if, if you have you know, memory, uh, your input output channels, how, 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 quickly, you know, what, how quickly can you get things in and out. But the distribution components are the same. You have single threads of execution, each running on a core, uh, and the more you can distribute your system, the more you can leverage a, a many core uh, platform. Um, is that controversial? I, I, it can't be. You know, if you know, an operating system takes advantage of this, right? we've been doing operating system work for, you know, for, for decades and decades and decades to take advantage of these new architectures. So operating system for your code, think about that. Taking the design principles of an operating system, applying it to your code, and getting benefits of sort of operating system style benefits from that on new hardware architectures. And then, of course, it almost goes without saying at this point, but you can, this is a, a distributed system. This is a, I'm not sure what it actually is. It's kind of a cool picture. But uh, it shows you something that's really, really, dis obviously super distributed. It's super <laughs> distributed. But how hard is it to take, you know, remember the diagram of the system, the black dots with little messages passing. How hard would it be to take that and move it someplace else? It's not hard. It's communicating over wires, it's communicating over air, it's communicating you know, through light and x-rays and all sorts of, I don't know, probably not x-rays, that, that's probably stupid to say. I don't know how they communicate. <laughs> I don't know, how they, I, don't, I, I literally don't know, it's magic to me. I'm software, I'm not, I don't get down to that level. But um, you know, it opens up this, op this opportunity uh, to now write software that is distributed fundamentally, it's endemic. It's part of the way you actually write your software. So Alex was talking this morning about um, singletons and the problem of, of a bottleneck. Um, so I would, I, would, I would argue that uh, it's not a problem. You, you have a bottle, right? It's got a bottle, you know, bottle of beer, it's got a bottleneck, and you pour it into your glass, and it works fine. You, you only need to remove the bottleneck if you have to dump your beer into your cup extremely quickly. In some cases, that might be important because you want that beer now. <laughs> For most of us, we can just like pour it in slowly. So it, it, it only becomes a problem when it actually is a problem. But if you have a system, you can now start to think about, I mean, what does a singleton mean here? It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a singleton in the architectural pattern sense. It's a, really, it's a single service. It is you know, your single point of failure. It's your single point of access. It's not distributed. And how many things are, are architected that way? Lots of things are architected that way. It's okay. When that thing becomes an, a problem bottleneck, then you can distribute that. But if you don't have a system to start with, what are you even talking about? You can't even reason about this problem. You can't break something apart. So, uh, you know, I think most, uh, Alex is talking about most, most programs have this singleton problem. But it really, it's, he's talking about a registered service, so it has, a, it has a single name, it has a single instance, and everything has to go through that. So to take that and reason about, okay, how do I take this and now make it distributed, is an interesting and very solvable, pro generally solvable problem. It can, be, it can be very complicated. The Basho folks will tell you it, it, it can be very, very complicated to do that. So I'm not going to, in many cases, you can distribute that fairly trivially. So if you write your code in functions that can be then called by different um, 
uh, processes, then you can have, you can, you can refactor along this vector. But if you don't have a system, you can't even start to think about things this way. Remember the system, the operating system, the dots communicating. One of those dots is your bottleneck. Right? If you have a bottleneck today, so a common bottleneck today in a, in a web app would be your reverse proxy. So this is the thing that actually talks to your, your uh, web clients, and then it'll go do round robin distribution back to your app servers. Well, that's a single that is generally a single point of failure for, for small, naive websites. How do you fix that? Well, you add multiple reverse proxies, and you can use DNS to do your distribution. So now, D now your bottleneck has moved up to DNS, or your, your, your point of failure has moved out to the DN D DNS tier. Right? The point there is not that there's one good way to do it versus another. The point is it's a system. And once you have a system in place, you can think about how to make things more efficient, address certain problems, move things around. That comes for free when you have this process isolation. Okay, that's performance. So there was a quick, quick couple hits. Performance on multi-core and performance, it's not, not speed, I mean just sort of the, the nature, the performance characteristics. Uh, scale out with distribution. I want to talk about quality. So, it, it almost goes without saying. If you have process isolation, you have safety. So, the more, you, the more processes that you have running in your application, the less likely any one of them will become a real problem or a significant problem. And the idea is you want to drive your, you drive your application development at the system layer to the point where it's, it's a matter of odds. It's, a matter of, uh, it's, 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 it's just a matter of numbers. Most of these things will be working most of the time. And then when something fails, the smaller that thing is, the less impact it will have on your system. When you write Erlang code, this is, the way, this is the way you think about things. Because everything is a process, all of your activity is coordinated on, along the lines of these processes, and they're isolated. So when you have a fault in one of these things, frowny face here, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have this ripple effect, it shouldn't have a ripple effect, it certainly isn't going to corrupt the memory of other processes. So you, you are safer. Operating system. Something crashes, your phone still works, your computer still works. There's a level of safety. If you didn't have that level of safety, you wouldn't install applications on it. If everyone w was running an embedded system here, you would have very, very few applications that you were able to run because you didn't trust them. You, you'd have to trust them at a very, very high level. When you have a distributed system like this, you don't have to trust everything. You can be much more cavalier about what you put into your code, put into production. So what does that give you? Very interesting feature. If you don't care so much about whether something works, right, you don't. It doesn't have to work all the time. You can get very aggressive about specifying correct behavior. So you no longer have to write defensive code. By having process isolation and not having this you know, horrible, horrible thing happen uh, when something goes wrong, you don't have to worry about something going wrong. That's called happy path coding. So in the Erlang community, you'll, you'll hear occasionally this term happy, well, anywhere, uh, it, but especially at Erlang, we like to see happy path. So don't put error handling code in your program. Leave it out. Why? Well, oh, by the way, this is, code, this is Erlang code, if you don't recognize it. The Essentials OTP talk does have a sample of code. It's just, it's just I had to have it in there. So let's go over this really quickly. Um, take that first line, OK, comma, DB connect. What this is doing is it's going to, that equal sign is, is, not a, is, a, is not a value assignment. It is basically an assertion. It's a truth-seeking operation. And it either will succeed or it will fail. So the result of the connect function will either match OKDB okay, or it will not match. If it doesn't match, your process will crash. It's like a seg fault for your program. It, but, it's, but, it's, but it's contained within the Erlang VM. Your whole program, your whole VM stays up. It's just the one process will fail. So that's the containment. That's this thing here. That's the safety. So if that didn't match, sm frowny face occurs. That's a crashed, crashed process. This is telling me that the, the developer is expecting this connect to always succeed. It's an assertion. So what's the one problem with assertions? Assertions are great. You can't have enough assur assertions. But what's the big problem with an assertion? If you, if you turn them off, you know, you say it's time to ship the program, you turn them all off. Does anyone use assertions in their code? Everyone should use assertions. Come on. Everyone raise their hand just for fun. 
Come on, everyone, yeah. All right, excellent. Everyone, everyone should use assertions. Um, well, you're basically specifying your, the behavior of, of your, you're, you're saying this should happen, this should happen, this should happen. If it doesn't, it should catastrophically fail. Erlang lives and breathes assertions. In fact, it's baked into the language. I mean, this is an assertion, uh, you know, OKDB. Okay, um, the assertion here in the case expression, um, these top two will, you know, it has to be an integer or a float, otherwise it'll fail. You're, you're, by, you're implicitly asserting that it is only these two, these two items. So it's this extremely assertive or aggressive or non-defensive mode of coding. What you get is less code, because there's no error handling code, Error handling code is very, very hard to write, so you don't have to do, worry about that. Really? Ten minutes? I'll, I'll go. We'll crank through this. <clears throat> um, and you also have, uh, you also have uh, a, a, a specification of the correct behavior of, of your program. I think this is a huge feature. This is why I like it as a general pur purpose programming language. You don't have to have a big concurrency problem to get benefit here. You're writing less code. Your code is running uh, more reliably. And you're enjoying, you know, hanging out with your friends because you're not having to go tr troubleshoot, you know, production issues a fraction of the time. The, the, the production quality of an Erlang system, even if it's poorly written, should surpass that of most systems because of these, because of the, the, the characteristics I'm describing here. Oh, yeah, I'll get this in 10 minutes, no problem. Okay, so design implications for your code. The simple fact of, of isolating processes leads you down this road of building service-oriented architecture. Service-oriented architecture is the way you should build stuff. If you were at uh, Dave Thomas's talk last night, basically the vision is everything is a microservice. You view your universe as services. Um, they're great to reason about. You can monitor them. You can, um, you can improve them selectively. But I think most importantly, they drive systems development. So operating system, service-oriented architecture, it's all sort of the same in, the, in the, same, uh, the same territory. And the real driver for me, this is what get, personally gets me very excited about service orientation, is that rather than building monolithic programs, so you, know, you have some large class hierarchy, you know, if you're using an object-oriented language like Java, Java or C++ or C Sharp, you are viewing the world through the lens of a taxonomy. It's a global sort of you know, monolithic, you know, hard-coded, static type system that you've created for your, is it like a DSL in effect, a, a, you know, a, a application specific type system, and that's the universe. In a systems approach like this, it is much more like evolution, where you can have a system, right? Imagine the, the, the dots, right? You have a system. What do you do to add, what do you do to modify that system? You can add another dot. You don't have to change every. What do you change in a system? It's very difficult to refactor a system. You don't even think in terms of refactor. I'm going to go and refactor everything. No, you, you tweak a specific part of it. You can, you can add function. You can, you can modify functionality by adding things. This is the way things evolve. So what is this? What is this crazy picture I have? This is a flagella of flagellum on a, some bacteria, bacterium. So this is an interesting, this is, comes from uh, the machinery of life. Um, and it's just a very interesting picture to, to, to drive down into the organic level, the, 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 you know, the proteins and the, the, the building blocks of this. And how did this come about? Well, I mean, some would, some would argue persuasively, I think, that it was a series of very, very small steps. Incredible. These, these things can spin at 14,000 RPM. I mean, it's just, fan, it just like the engineering feat of this, 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 this trivial little structure that are here that propels bacteria around, around is fantastic. And it occurred through systems, you know, evolutionary approach. So we start with something basic, and we add something, or we modify, and gradually we get incredible complexity. So if somebody says, well, how do you really build complex systems uh, using this OS approach, this service-oriented approach? My question would be, how do, you, how do you build it without it? Is there any evidence that we have effective complex systems that have not evolved, you know, through sort of gradual stepwise progression? So I'm getting a little philosophical here, but you know, remember it's a religion, and so I'm 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 sort of leaking into that territory here. But I think it's important to keep it, for 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 me. Yes, there are a lot of performance advantages. Yes, there's quality advantage. But all of this kind of drives an approach to building software that I think is extremely powerful, extremely le leverageable. Now, is that essential Erlang? I think it might be advanced Erlang, but you get a feel, hopefully, for the 
the territory that you're delving. If you start to go down the road of, of Erlang, this I think should be front and center for you. This whole idea of process isolation driving a completely different model, a much better model for application development. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I have one slide, and it's not it's not nearly value add versus a, a Q and A. So I'm going to stop and see if anyone has questions. We could do an ultra call. Just kidding. It'd be very awkward if I did that. I'm just kidding. Questions? Yeah. So when you say you're going to let a, something in Erlang crash, like how do you? What's the what's the philosophy between handling something when, when it crashes? So the question is, you know, what's the philosophy? What's the philosophy of handling a crash? So, so there's a you know, the, the thing that crashes can't recover itself. So you need something else, and that something else is a process. So and you can have multiple processes, but generally there's a supervisory process that will keep an eye on another process. And so when we say, you know, oh, something crashed and, and uh, it was restarted, the examples I used was, was of mainly of a human. Your, your browser crashed. So you are this external agent and you're observing that it crashed and you restart it manually. In Erlang, you have a process. It's by convention called a supervisor. You can monitor the state of, of, of another process and you get notification when that process dies. So the system itself, uh, it's just like trapping exit in an operating system. So you get notification that something crashed, and now you can take action. Any other questions here? I mean, it's essential. It should be a lot of questions. Some questions? So on that point, um, the, uh, the Erlang has a fairly enlightened, well, I don't know if it's enlightened. It has to work this way. When something crashes and is restarted, you have, the thing that restarts it has to know how to restart it. So in Erlang, there's a, 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 an emphasis around um, clean and consistent initialization of your process. And so that's another, it's when you get into programming Erlang systems, you will be entering the realm of operating system person. So when you, when you, when you run a server with, uh, uh, let's just not say Apache, because it's let's Nginx or Node, you're responsible for, you know, when that machine boots up, it goes through a very specific initialization phase. It starts up all the core services that it needs, you know, syslog and cron and these things, and then you're, Serv your services layer comes up. All that's extremely precisely codified in an initialization scheme that maps to Erlang exactly. It, Erlang has a very precise initialization scheme. All of your code thinks about how does this start up? How do I get to a clean state? Because that's the way you recover. It's, you know, for an access point, you know, what's the way you fix an access point? Do you go and, you know, tell net into the system and try to, you know, debug registers and figure out where the corrupt state is in your access point? Your wireless routers is broken. Has anyone ever, like, tell net into the system to try to, to, to debug it? Anybody? No one. You just one person. Corey, of course. Yeah, yeah of, cor of course we all do that, right? No, we don't. We unplug it and plug it back in. It's much easier and always works. So, Erlang code is that way. Um, we don't really care so much about why something failed. Sometimes you do, well, some, a lot of times you do, but you don't have to. Yeah, you don't have to know why that wireless access point failed. I don't really care. I just want it to work again as fast as possible. Unplug, plug it back in, get back to work. That's very much the philosophy of Erlang. You don't have to figure out every little detail because, you know, that picture of the smiley faces, that one little corrupt thing goes down, restart it, up we go again. Yeah, did you have a Someone at one person. I'm not leaving until there's at least one more question. I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. Yeah. So Scala's, run, so Scala's running on top of the VM, uh, the Java VM. <laughs> the VM. It has kind of become the VM, hasn't it? Um, so you have a shared heap, and you have a library like, uh, you know, I don't know there are libraries, Akka, for example. There may be sort of pseudo protection, um, but you can still access, you know, shared memory. So you still have, in, you, you, your concurrency unit is threading. But I know that there are, there are you know, good patterns for ma managing that. Uh, you write to queues and you pull off a queues. So there are best practices that are implemented there. But you don't have the assurance that uh, these things are isolated. So when you have a corruption in one, there's no guarantee that it will not affect the other. Um, so it's a little bit like, well, it's a lot like Windows 3.1, I hate to say it. Windows 3.1 has that. You know, everyone cooperated. Everyone managed best practices. But what, what actually happened there? The system was re not reliable. So I think you have to have guarantees around this if you want sort of proper operating system for your code benefits. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on uh, orchestration <coughs> and supervision of 
processes above the level of a single, say, Erlang VM or, or machine? So yeah, you leak in. So the question is, you know, uh, su su supervision and orchestration above the, above a Java virtual machine. So a sorry, Erlang virtual machine. Um, the Erlang virtual machine is an OS process. So if you're going to supervise this, you're into the operating system level. So you can do that. There's lots of tools for you know, starting things and monitoring them. And in fact, if you're not, you're probably not doing proper systems work. Everybody supervises a process some, somehow. You know, you, you, you know it, 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 I know it, um, there's a pattern of you know, con just running a cron job that constantly tries to restart something. So that's a form of supervision, it's kind of polling form. But you can, you can monitor and trap exits. And, and there's libraries that are very, very good and very mature for doing that. Orchestrating services, um, you know, tools for that as well. But that definitely moves outside the area of Erlang and into. But it's the same concept. It's the same, same dynamic, exactly. Okay, with that, I'm, I'm all done, and I guess I can also introduce the next talk.